It's really good to see everyone again gathered here today and online, and I'm very excited to introduce this uh, next session, which is the first of three sessions right before lunch that are focused on societal and economic applications. Uh, once again, I'm Gita Lubacic from McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. Okay, wonderful. We have our title slide here. So our, uh, our session now is entitled Sila Kamnupa, so how's the weather in Inuktitut? And we're focused on integrating Inuit Kauyumai to Kangit and environmental monitoring and forecasting products to support travel safety around Mitimatalik, which is Pond Inlet, Nunavut. So just a quick introduction, Inuit Kauyumai to Kangit refers to Inuit knowledge and values. And we have four amazing guests with us today. Two of them are here in person. Two, um, one will be live online and one has contributed a presentation online. So all of these uh, are, are colleagues and friends of mine that I've worked with in various capacities and that have each worked with each other on various projects as well. So Natasha Simoni is an educator and uh, in independent researcher in Pond Inlet, so in Mitimatulik Nunavut. Uh, Dr. Natalie Carter is here. She's a research associate with me and community engagement lead with my research team at McMaster. Uh, Andrew Ariak is joining us uh, live online from Mitimatulik. He is the regional operations lead for the Kikitaluk region, which is the Baffin region. Uh, for Smart Ice. And uh, Dr. Catherine Wilson is also here with us, and she is the Director of Knowledge Co production at Smart Ice. And you'll hear all about Smart Ice and all their initiatives uh, to follow right now. So, um, one more quick thing if you can go to the next slide. Maybe I can do it. Yes. I just wanted to highlight, so Northern Canada is a homeland to many indigenous nations, um, but particularly in the Arctic, it is Inuit Nunangat, so Inuit homelands. Um, Inuit Tabarit Kanatami uh, provided this figure that this is their map that they use to highlight. Uh, so the, this is the National Inuit Organization in Canada, and Inuit Nunangat comprises four regions which are settled land claims between Inuit and the Canadian government. So the Inuvialuit Settlement Region, Northern, Northwest Territories. Nunavut was a new territory established in 1999. Nunavik in Northern Quebec, and Nunatsiavut is a self-governing region in Northern Labrador. So we're specifically talking today, all the examples today are from Mitimatalik, which you can see on the very northern tip of Baffin Island, right near Sirmalik National Park. So I will turn it over to Natasha Simoni, who is presenting from Mitimatalik. My name is Natasha Simone. I'm from Pond Inlet. I am a mother, a hunter, a community researcher, and a teacher. I love the outdoors and have worked on many research projects in my community, mainly involving marine mammals and environment. Over the last few years, weather products and services available to our community have improved a lot. And before then, a local elder named Jake Walulu and myself voluntarily provided weather information to our community members. Our challenges were specifically with marine forecasting. These services were just not made for people like us in the community. We had to go to multiple websites to be able to compile information from everywhere and provide one weather forecast update to a hunter. And so that's what the time consuming part was. Since then, we've 
started to learn what all these different weather forecasting information mean to us and we've become pretty familiar translating all this information interpreting the data of this information but also interpreting this information into Inuktitut on the spot and so we're taking a color-coded system off of windy.com and providing Inuktitut weather updates to people who are out on the land in addition to that, Jake was spent a lot of time trying to understand very specifically what each color code meant in terms of, yes, you can go, no, you shouldn't go, maybe you should wait it out. And so we've spent a lot of time trying to understand this and be able to use it to the best of our abilities. And now we can communicate with our community members instead of providing this lengthy weather forecast. Here's what we're seeing. Here's what we're reading. We can just say the next couple of days are going to be green. And the majority of people listening understand that it's going to be windy. It's it's not ideal boating condition. You might want to take out your sleeping bag and stay an extra couple of days. <laughs> so over the years, our work has led to other work and other opportunities. We've written a paper titled Sila Kanwipa, How's the Weather? And it's also led to our work and involvement with an Arctic Net funded project, understanding weather, water and ice uses of services and product. It's not quite done, it's getting close to done. Are we able to start it again or should we continue and see if we come back to it? If it's not possible to get it going right away, but it, if it is possible to bring up Natalie's slides, we could continue and then hopefully come back because Natasha has a wonderful ending here to share. So if Natalie's slides come up, we can keep going. you for now and we'll see if we can get it back. Thank you. Good morning everyone. So Natasha was speaking about um, a paper. It was just scrolling there right before the, the video stopped and I was closely involved with writing that paper. So I'm going to um, just share a few more of the highlights from it. But Natasha also spoke about another project, a survey about Inuit uses um, of weather, water, ice and climate information and products. And so Gita Lubachic, Jason Carpenter, and I will be speaking about that more at 1.30 this afternoon if you're interested in learning about it. 
So in their paper, Natasha and Jaco identified a number of strengths and challenges impacting their use of polar prediction products in community forecasting and also in making travel decisions. The first of these was their insufficient geographic and seasonal coverage, and those products that do supply those are very helpful. There's only one weather station in town, which is at the airport, and as Tasha says, I can assure you no one is hunting there. So having information about the local use areas where people do go is very helpful, and products that make it possible to zoom in and look at those areas really help. As all of you know, condi conditions in the Arctic change very rapidly, so having near real time or frequently updated information can really aid in making those safe travel decisions as well. We've heard a bit about this earlier, but the internet is very slow in Nunavut, and it's expensive, so downloading or streaming data-rich images is a real challenge. It's slow, it's tedious, and it uses a lot of data. Having to look up multiple sources of information, which Natasha mentioned, this is in part related to bandwidth, having to look at so many different sites, but also the information sometimes is conflicting and this can really cause confusion. Having to do mathematical calculations, for instance, converting knots into kilometers per hour or remembering to add or subtract an hour, for instance, from tide tables, can lead to confusion and not everyone knows how to do it and can result in people getting off track or getting stranded. Some of the nautical terms in particular are vague or unfamiliar, um, such as bergy water is one that's unfamiliar in pond inlet, or light wind is vague, those terms used in marine forecasts. And this ties into the next point about unknown relationships of the information that's provided compared to if it's safe to go out and how it's relevant to community needs. So for instance, knowing can people go out in their small boats, in bergy water, or in light wind. Sometimes there's irrelevant or missing information, such as temperature or, or ice forecasts, or leaving out relevant information, such as visibility, ice leads, open water, land fast ice. Um, those can also create challenges in developing, in developing uh, local forecasts. And the last, of course, is that people travel really far, much farther than cell phone coverage or VH coverage, and so need to rely on satellite phones and contact other people to look up the information for them. So that can be a challenge. So Natasha and Jaco identified three main product requests that can better meet the local needs and uses of people in Pond Inlet, and that's that they be user-friendly, complete, and locally applicable. And I've provided the citation to the paper there. Um, there's a vast amount of detail about these comments, so I'm just gonna quickly highlight three. One example of making products user-friendly, I mentioned about having to download these data-rich images or stream the graphics. So reducing the image size while keeping sufficient quality for clear viewing would really help. And so would including options to read text or stream animation versus download. And windy.com is an example of a product that has that included in it. Making the products complete for local use, a challenge is not having them available at certain times of year. So providing weather, marine, and ice products for local users in all of the seasons when they go out would be very helpful. And the last is a, a suggestion to make the products locally relevant. And I mentioned about unfamiliar, meaningless terminology. Um, and so defining these nautical terms using non-technical vocabulary that could be approved by communities and providing those numerical equivalents in miles and kilometers would really be helpful. So I invite you to, to read the paper if you're interested. And I'll stop there and hand the floor over to Mr. Andrew Ariak. Oh, yes, so just before Andrew speaks, he is joining us online, but if you can play that Smart Ice video, so that is the background about Smart Ice that you will then hear about 
from Andrew and Catherine. It's a social enterprise that empowers Indigenous communities across Canada's north to make more it's informed decisions before traveling on ice. Indigenous communities because of climate change, north that ice is becoming thinner and less predictable. On ice. It is becoming more dangerous to travel change, on. That ice is Enter Smart Ice and as an internationally recognized award-winning climate solution. On. It combines indigenous knowledge, sensor technology, and satellite imagery to help communities safely navigate hazardous ice. Our social enterprise business model commits to maximizing social impact and creating positive community change, while collaboratively delivering ice information services with communities for communities across the Arctic. Smart Ice puts innovative technology into the hands of communities so they can adapt their travel plans to unprecedented ice conditions. It trains local operators to use smart ice sensors to monitor ice thickness along community travel routes. Operators are trained to deploy autonomous sensors called smart buoys to monitor ice conditions near and far from their community. Operators also run regular ice thickness surveys along community trails using a smart homodick which is pulled behind a snowmobile. The community receives this travel safety information on smartphones and computers through the internet platform Siku, as well as local radio and posted maps in public places. SmartIce is assembling the smart buoy sensors in our northern production center in Nain Nunatsiabut, where we employ Inuit youth from our employment readiness. We seem to be having a, an, a duplication of all of our audio today, so really apologies about that. We, we just thought we would stop the video so you don't keep hearing it back and forth twice. So unfortunately, you won't hear that, but I think we, we might be able to share a link perhaps later to that video. Um, so we'll go straight to Andrew, who is here, and hopefully we will not have two audios of Andrew. Hopefully we'll hear you clearly. Uh, good Andrew, can you hear us? Oh, now we can't hear you at all. We can see you. <laughs> okay. Oh, now we can hear good you. Good morning, bonjour. We can hear you. It sounds good. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> oh, wait, sorry. Andrew, <laughs> Okay, yeah, yeah. go ahead and introduce yourself, Andrew. They're trying to get some slides up, but maybe you can talk a little bit about Smart Ice and the work that you do. Um, Smart Ice is a nonprofit organization, a social enterprise, meaning we're looking into community-based research in safety and awareness of sea ice. Awesome. And what Smart Eyes does is we monitor sea ice conditions in real time for our community. And we are, Smart Eyes is <clears throat> creating sea ice safety maps, and we are training our Northern employees to create their sea ice safety maps for their communities. <laughs> maps are produced weekly and when the ice is changing to help our community with sea ice safety and awareness. To make maps, we learn how we should combine GIS and remote sensing skills. We are creating these maps because there are no other maps being created that are being produced like this, targeting community needs for CI safety and incorporating IQ and values. More satellite imagery is av available now, but not everyone is trained how to interpret the images. It is important that we create the CI safety maps and for them to be available for our community because we are community based. We are determined in having control over the data, which never leaves the community because we target community needs in our language. 
And sea ice is forming a little later and breaking off a little earlier each year. And with the map producing for my community, I will be able to inform in real time of sea ice conditions. In Natasha and Andrew's presentation, we can see how some of these current MET products aren't, aren't meeting the needs of their community. They're not at the right spatial and temporal scales. It's not in their language or using weather and sea ice terms that have meaning for them. And the reasons these products don't work is because current products have been designed from a Western perspective. So in response, individuals like Natasha have taken it on herself to take these products and interpret them for her own community. Research projects like at McMaster University and others, and organizations like Smart Ice are working to fill these gaps. And these presentations really demonstrate how in the case of, of Mitamatalik, Inuit can deliver their own MET services in their own communities. The year of polar prediction had very little indigenous involvement. Um, and while improvements to models and forecasts for the Arctic have been made, the new products that will result from YOMP will continue to be based on a Western perspective. So how do we begin to work together? Um, I don't have all the answers, but there's so much potential, and I'm an incredible optimist. So based on my 27 years of experience as a non-Indigenous person working in the Arctic, as someone who's worked at a national MET service and um, in providing community-scale sea ice information, I have some ideas. The first challenge is that scale often determines funding. National MET organizations are funded to provide services at national and regional scales. They don't have the funding or the expertise to provide community-specific products for northern communities. We demonstrated today that individuals and northern organizations can co-design with Indigenous people, products and services to meet their needs. However, funding at community scales for the past 20 years has been restricted to research and pilot projects. So maintaining or expanding current community scale services is not sustainable based on external project by project funding. Funding for community scale MET services by Indigenous experts needs to be adequate and sustained. The next challenge is that who is in control of the MET services determines who these products will ultimately serve. Currently, the national MET services continue to provide services from a Western, not an Indigenous perspective. So what can we do about these challenges? We just need to start thinking of new ways of delivering products and services. So what about a scalable, collaborative approach to Northern MET services? Why not have the National MET services focus on what they're good at? Providing services at national and regional scales and advancing monitoring, modeling, and forecasting. And why not have Indigenous and Northern organizations focus on co-developing and training Indigenous peoples to deliver MET services at community scales. Ongoing long-term funding to Indigenous and Indigenous-led organizations to support Northern meteorological capacity at community, community scales can provide tremendous benefits, for example. The first is bridging scales and knowledge systems. Community products that are based on indigenous knowledge, skills, values, and experience will only contribute to a better understanding of polar meteorology. 
There would be enhanced community-based monitoring to fill gaps and met observations. Employment. The jobs would be in communities, close to their families, close to their culture, without having to leave and come down south. They're, they'd learn transferable skills for career advancements. There'd be local experts for the MET services in each community for public, aviation, and defense purposes. There'd be cross-training opportunity for, for MET services on local scale processes and, and knowledge. And then there could be also potu uh, potential future employees from the communities. Self-determination. We've seen how developing their own products can strengthen and revitalize knowledge, cultural practices that were weakened during colonization and residential schooling. Training to do this work provides control over how these services are provided in their communities. For MET services, this creates a huge space for Indigenous perspectives in Northern MET products. It supports Indigenous reconciliation and self-determination, and it builds trust in our national MET services. And of course, we'll have improved products and services that meet community needs in a timely and accessible fashion. We'll have folks in the communities that can translate our national products into local dialects, increase trust in the national MET products. We'd have a better understanding of northern needs to improve MET service and products. And having local experts provide real-time weather and satellite interpretation would improve the scale of ice charts for responsible shipping and resource development. So, just a few ideas for you to start thinking about um, and ways we can improve our Northern Met services. So, I thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to ongoing discussions and brainstorming on future polar service priorities. Thank you. Koyanami Ralu to Natasha and Natalie and Andrew and Catherine. Um, I would love to open it now to uh, at least a few questions before lunch. It's very, uh, very interesting that our live presenter from Miti Matalik had the least amount of technical difficulties today. So <laughs> thank you, Andrew. That was very, very smooth. Um, does anyone have questions? Please, yeah. Grab the mic there. <laughs> Sarah Jordan calls uh, National Snow Ice Data Center, um, University of Colorado. So I, um, I've learned that uh, through these presentations and some other ones in this meeting that Windy is used a lot for because because of its simple interface. So my my question is simply, um, how far would it go to have that at a really fine scale? Because scale is obviously what what it. Um, um, information at scale is obviously what it doesn't deliver, but it's the sort of intuitive, easy to grasp interface. If that was, if an interface of that nature could be um, you know, downscaled to the, to, the, to the level that would be useful for local communities, how far would that go to meeting the needs of um, the indigenous communities? And does that, I mean, isn't it still a Western designed um, interface? I mean. So I, I'm trying to understand the, if there's a mismatch there um, or whether it's just a scale problem. Andrew, do you want to respond to that one? <clears throat> Thank you for, for the question. Um, the, the main thing we look at when we try and go out online is wind direction, wind speed, and the temperature. Um, not all sites are spot on, but they are pretty close. And once we go out online and determine that this site had a better prediction than this one. So, so that's where Windy came along and it was getting um, good readings so of before going out online. It was pretty accurate and that's when work got around that Windy was pretty accurate and 
everybody started using it and nice and simple, color coded. Uh, all we look for is wind speed, wind direction and temperature mainly before we head out. Anything you want to add there? Thanks, Andrew. Natasha spoke to you in the, her video about how some cross-checking was done, kind of ground truthing of, of Windy. And I think that was an important part of it too, right, Andrew, that people got comfortable with knowing, yes, we could trust it and what it, what it meant, whether or not people could go voting. And I know at the time people were shocked that Jaco, the elder who was sharing it, could say, don't go out, it's gonna get windy in four hours. Like, how do you know this? This is amazing. So I think there's a lot of potential there for, for that scale and being to zoom in right into the areas that they're looking at, wanting to go. Um, my question wasn't gonna be about windy, but well, my experience certainly is uh, many of the northern operators I've talked to are using windy rather than what the Meteorological Service of Canada is providing, both in the north and in the south. I guess I have two questions. One is, uh, how much engagement has been done with the Meteorological Service of Canada to actually adopt their products, ad adapt their products for the needs of uh, northern peoples? And the second question is, uh, is there been any work being done K to 12 in the school system to actually bridge some of the knowledge systems between weather, water, and climate uh, STEM? And so starting at, in the K to 12 um, with some of this uh, information. So two, kind of two questions. I don't think I can answer on the med service part. I don't know if there's anybody else here who can. My understanding is that the products are um, are developed internally and then pushed out. Um, unless someone can correct me on that. And so because of that, I don't think there has been any training done. And because of that, I don't think there's been any training done within communities in, in K to 12. So that's, that's it. <laughs> Pond Inlet, my understanding, Pond Inlet is where the uh, education, the Department of Education is, for Nunavut is actually located in Pond Inlet. It would be a wonderful place to start. So I will, as the, uh, as the CMOS representative here, um, connect with the Meteorological Service of Canada, as well as uh, I've made some connections earlier with K-12 on this stuff. So um, yeah, and Catherine, as part of Arctic SIG, I think we need, this is an area we can work together on. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Just wanted to ask Andrew if you want to add any comment on that related to the schools, um, either bringing in IQ into the schools or, you know, this kind of understanding of uh, weather, water, ice services in the school system. Well, as um, <clears throat> Smart Ice has um, started um, making uh, booklets. So, um, <clears throat> um, and in these booklets, we have sea ice terms and definitions in our la in our language, so the school system <clears throat> will be able to teach what to look for what certain type of sea ice is called at a certain time of the ice season because there are at least 68 words and terms in sea ice alone for, for my community <clears throat> um, to keep our language strong, smart ice. We documented the sea ice terms in our language for it to be available for the next generation because not everyone has a father figure who can take them out on the land and show them the ropes 
and show them what to read of what weather is coming up or if, if it will be safe to travel or if we will have to wait the wait it out for the weather to improve there it's um we're taking little steps at a time and we want to do this right and in order for to do it right meetings and meetings and looking at drafts for other community members to go through it's time consuming but it, it is worth it I, I hope that answers some of your question thank you andrew that that's great and we hear the next generation there say hi to your family <laughs> yes <laughs> Um, I, I saw Barbara with her hand up. Do you want to ask the last question? Thank you very much. So um, thank you. Thank you very much for this, you know, it's like a nice overview. I, I really liked uh, uh, your comment about, you know, like um, whether serv med services should provide, you know, like concentrate on what they're good at, provide accurate forecast, and uh, then you um, point out that I hope I understood correctly, that the um, user communities are the ones that should concentrate in adapting the uh, products to what is useful for the community. And uh, also the educational part is, has to be embedded into the community, right? So I understand, though, from James that there is also a component there that uh, as whether services can give, in a sense, you know, educate the user community on how to use our weather products would be, that could be probably, you know, a good collaborations in a sense, you know, and it's good that the Sera group, the Sera group did a fantastic job in connecting with the communities in this PPP. Now looking at the future in pickup, uh, what is the role of the Sera group? That's the question that I would like to see actually in the brainstorming sessions, because I'm thinking, while you have a great connections now, and uh, for example, for certain users, we can design products like Windiva, even you know, um, moving, even you know, do something even better. Maybe I don't know. I don't know Windy. I need to look at it. <laughs> but uh, you know, but also for other communities potentially. So you give us the link, but at a certain point, you are are you the buffer between these met services and these communities that can help us this communication flow and the educational part. So in you know, designing uh, this uh, user uh, uh, products and so on, that's the question. Yes, I think that's a great question that we should consider adding to our brainstorming sessions either today, perhaps even tomorrow, to be really forward looking on the role of our PPP Sarah committee. Um, just quickly on the last point, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's what we try to do is, is be, I don't know about a buffer, but maybe more a connector or a facilitator, you know, trying to really connect experts that we work with in communities like Andrew and Natasha and Jayco and connect with experts working in the MET services like we've met many here today. And so, you know, just trying to, um, yeah, I guess create bridges, uh, create discussion, um, and, and provide opportunities to get together directly. Either we've been doing some of that in Zoom meetings and some of that in in-person meetings um, to, to, yeah, I guess the information flow, the idea flow is so important. So, yeah, I, I see it as more of a facilitating kind of role. We're not the experts on either side, but learning from, from both and trying to build those relationships and connections. Thank you. Yes, we hope to talk a lot more about that this afternoon in brainstorming sessions already. Um, and we can think about adding that question. Yeah. Um, do you want to add anything to that, Andrew? Connecting user needs and services? No? <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you all for your patience. I know it took a little more time with some of our technical issues here. Um, I really want to thank Andrew for joining us uh, from Meet to Lake today, and thank you to Catherine 
and Natalie and, and Natasha for preparing her presentation. We'll see if we can get the last of it played as people are packing up. Natasha does have some great messages at the end. We'll try and get it, get it playing again. Um, very quick reminder, just before you go, Andrew, quick reminder to everyone here um, to just check your presentations before, if you have sessions this afternoon, maybe just connect with the tech folks here to make sure that your presentation is there and everything's working okay. We'll keep working on getting things to flow smoothly. Um, and also, we'll be back here at 1.30 after lunch, and we have more uh, Sarah-focused present presentations after lunch. So yeah, thank you, Andrew. Good to see you. Thank you, Natalie, Catherine. <laughs>